Welcome to Chat Room. I'm really pleased to say that today we have with us Tony Backhouse, who wears many, many musical jackets. He's a <laughs> singer, composer, um, an ambassador of American gospel music, uh, traveled around the world, has many long histories with funk soul bands, and has come back to live in Napier and come to talk to us today. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> nice to be here. It's a pleasure. So, tell us, you know, about your upbringing. You know, gospel music is not something that you normally would hear in church, in a Presbyterian church in um, Auckland. No, 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 that's right. You grow up, you know, the church I went to was Anglican. The main job was to stay at least half a beat behind the organ <laughs> and mumble into your, you know, through the 17 verses of, the, of a hymn. Yeah. That in kind of archaic English that kind of made no sense but to me at the time. Um, yes, I mean, I just grew up in Auckland and, and went to university in Wellington and did a music degree, which was actually severely classical. You know, they didn't admit that anything other than the kind of Western art music tradition existed. And were you a guitarist? Is that what was yeah, your predominant did, instrument? Um, uh, well, actually, I was, grew up listening to Elvis and then the Beatles, and so, you know, I pestered my parents for a guitar, and finally they bought me one with the caveat that I got classical guitar lessons. So I got guitar lessons from a very good teacher called Len Doran, who was also a jazz guitarist. And he painlessly taught me a whole lot of stuff about theory. I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> so did you retain any of it? I did. Because yeah. when I went to university, um, I, without uh, any kind of um, letters, you know, any of those kind of exams that you take, um, I thought, oh, I might be, out, you know, not really up to speed here. But in actual fact, I was way ahead of the rest of the group in terms of theory because I had all the sort of jazz stuff. And when you're talking Somehow. about going to the group, you mean university? Yeah, yeah, going to um, a Victoria University and doing, I did English and then I did music. Did you want to write books or be a journalist? No, oh, I don't know. I was, I was just delaying my entry into the workforce yeah. as long as possible, <laughs> you know. And I really, I didn't think I was going to be a musician. Um, I was actually had some gifts as a as an artist, you know, I was painted a lot and I, and I grew up with this kind of weird notion that you only had one gift in your life to make the most of, so I assumed just because I liked music didn't mean to say I was going to be good at it, so I didn't assume anything about music, I just did Were it because I Were your parents liked it. musicians? Not really. <clears throat> my father was, had, a, had a voice, for sure, and uh, my mother loved music. So I went, I just went there and did, did music as an extra because I really liked it, then gradually I thought, Oh, well, you know, maybe I don't have any talent, but I might as well give it a go anyway. You know, what well, the hell? we won't tell your age, but you went that to university old. in the late 60s, in the early 60s. 70s. So this is a really, like, anti-war, anti-apartheid, yeah. very loose Beatles, time. It was the it was the Stones, <clears> it was the <throat> Vietnam War, it was all that sort of, you know. So did you start playing in a group at, the, at those? Oh, I, did. I started playing in a group in, in about the, the early 70s when I was at university. I had a group called Mammal with uh, Rick Bryant, who, you know, everybody knows as the kind of, uh, you know, the king of soul in, in New Zealand, and various other people who have gone on to become musicians. For example? Uh, <coughs> oh, Bill Lake, who's kind of done a whole lot of solo albums, um, and um, Kerry Jacobson and Robert Taylor in the band who joined Dragon and, you know, now live in Australia. They became very successful at that. And did you tour in New Zealand? Sort of, <coughs> yeah. We toured the universities. Yeah. Um, but we weren't like, playing in pub band. We were, we were a very obscure band, you know. We were playing our own stuff, which and I've just been listening to it a bit of it recently. Was a sort of a, a really uncomfortable mix of kind of soul music and prog rock. <laughs> and I, I, to my shame, I think I'm possibly responsible for the prog rock element of it. Anyway, it was some of it is not easy listening. Do you but remember who you were listening to at that time? I was listening to I was listening to Sly Stone and Jeff Beck. And uh, those are things, and Stevie Wonder, those are things I remember listening to, but I'd just come straight out of university, so I still had my ear full of um, Stockhausen and Bartok and a whole <laughs> lot of other stuff. Yeah. You know, but really, uh, you know, so I had a strength, my, you know, intellectually, I kind of wanted to kind of, you know, stretch things a little bit, you know, push the envelope, whatever the expression is, you know, but then kind of like gradually the rest of the group undermined these kind of highfalutin ideals of mine because they were kind of like dedicatedly kind of rootsy, you know, and I discovered James Brown and my life changed. Yeah, James Brown was the one who changed you. Yeah. It's interesting because Stevie Wonder and Sly and <coughs> the Family Stone would have their roots in gospel, I think. Yeah, oh, I think so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and Sly's <laughs> sister is, is a gospel singer these days, I think. I have I to say she... that I had a... Um, 
a, a limousine driver who was the brother-in-law of Sly Stone in San Francisco who mm. was telling me <laughs> that he wanted to resurrect their career because they still they still like you know live as a family in San Francisco. I, I think, think that they've they, originally done something actually. I think they still put, perform yeah. these days, but without Sly, I think he he's kind of lost he's a his little way bit, somewhere. Yeah, I think a little bit too much um, but medicinal. I think he was, yeah, but I think he he was an amazing singer. Totally Incredible. fearless singer and a great writer. You know. Yeah, Earth, Wind and Fire, and you all know, that Chicago, sort of stuff yeah. all this sort of, you know, blending of music. It was a good, yeah. So you era. were playing in these sunk, in the funk soul pop bands, yeah. listening on the sly to Sly Stock the Family Asm. Zone? Well, no, 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 we were all listening to Sly and we were all listening to James Brown. Um, so how did James Brown tell, change your life? I... It was a song, a Prisoner of Love, you know, the one, it's, you know, it's kind of cheesy old ballad by whoever it was, Perry Como or something like that. Just that, that voice and the kind of the fearlessness with which he it attacks that sort, of, that sort of stuff. I wait for night to night to find me. I don't know how he does it, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's just like, good. it's so solid, you know, and with the cheesy strings in the background, just the way he uses his voice, you know, no note seems to be beyond him. You know, no, just the way well, it's antithetical things. to sort of this humble English, Anglican, New Zealand upbringing. Exactly. And that's, and, and that's kind of what, what I, I like about, um, about, about the gospel thing is it's not actually about um, humility. I mean, it's about love, but it's about um, the tradition really celebrates all your gifts, you know, you know um, because, uh, yeah, the Anglican or something, I'm, you know, sorry, Anglicans, um, but it's all about. It is about being humble. You shouldn't kind of raise your voice because you might disturb your might or something like that. Whereas uh, the whole black thing seems to me to be based on if you've got these gifts, God's going to become a little bit miffed if you don't actually use them to the uttermost. You know, so. You know. Well, before we talk about how you became so involved in gospel, talk. You know, tell the audience a little bit about what's the origins of gospel music in uh, in the United States. Where did it come from? Um, well, I mean, you know, when people say gospel, I think these days they've got a, a, a lot of people have, it's a kind of an umbrella term for people that kind of encompasses spirituals and hymns and all sorts of stuff, really. There's a whole lot of different categories in there. So just briefly, I mean, you know, Africans came over and because, it, you know, African culture has a long, you know, they grow up with music. No, they don't grow up singing half a beat behind, you know, with the hymn book or anything mm -hmm. like that. Everybody sings, so, and everybody makes stuff up. So there's that kind of, you know, there's my kind of like very stereotypical and very generalization. So when they arrived in the new world, they had to make their own kind of fun because the master wasn't giving them any. You know, they adapted their practices to the kind of hymns and things that were taught to them. We have to go for a break. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll finish talking about the uh -huh. origins of gospel and how you are disseminating it through <laughs> Australasia. We'll be back with Tony Backhouse at Chat Room in a minute. Welcome back to Chat Room. We're here with the multi-talented Tony Backhouse and we're going to talk a little bit more about the origins of gospel. Yeah. Well, in the slave times there were the spirituals, which were that kind of natural you know, outpourings of people denied any other kind of form of expression. And those songs came out about, you know, obviously there's possibly some geniuses there who wrote them, but we don't know who they are. Or they came out through collective improvisation, people just sitting around and singing. Um, Wouldn't it be about the expression of desiring freedom? Yeah, a lot, and, and a lot of the spirituals are about that. And as you probably know, that a lot of them are coded messages. They're not only about transcendence, but about escaping from, escaping north to Canada or yeah. wherever, you know, things like um, a steal away. Was it? But the original rhythms uh, are African. I th yeah, I think so. Well, it's the, the, I think the genius of the, of the African-American people is they've taken the forms like um, hymn tunes and um, Scots prayer singing, uh, I think German folk songs. I'm a bit unclear about it, but there's a whole lot of other influences th there. And they just m melded it all together. They took the hymn and they turned it into, into something else. Or, you know, the last line of a hymn, they turned that into a new kind of form. So would you say that blues 
you know, comes out of the gospel tradition. When was there sort of a crossover? I think when did it, you know, penetrate into mainstream culture? I think that's probably uh, too big a question for my head. <laughs> but um, I think they both they grew up probably contemporaneously. You know, people sang in the fields. They sang while they were working, and then when they sing together, they would sing religious songs or secular songs. And then gradually, the church stream went in a in a more participatory, collaborative kind of fashion, which is where we're heading with gospel, and the blues turned into more of a um, an individual thing. Because you don't you don't sing you don't sing blues in the choir. No. You know, it's more an individual expression. Gospel certainly an individual expression, but it's a it's a communal individual expression. If that makes many kind of sense. So gospel really started in around about the um, 1920s. I think the word was first used the word gospel song. Might have been used loosely before then. Um, when Thomas A. Dorsey, really um, the father of gospel music, made it his mission to create a sacred song with a beat, and that was uh, that was it. And it wasn't universally kind of like accepted initially. You know, the Northern churches, you know, threw Thomas Dorsey and Mahalia Jackson out because it was kind of a little bit too kind of rootsy and not dignified enough. Now, because you know, after the Civil War, I mean, after the yeah, after the Civil War and slavery times. Um, the African Americans were trying to, to prove to the white men that they were as good at, if not better, at doing things like singing and things like that. And they wanted to just, you know, not only blend in, but do it. Do it better. Do it better. Do so it better. We'll talk about like Mahalia Jackson and also even the classical singers, the first great um, Afro American classical singers like Marian Anderson and yeah. Paul Robeson started bringing gospel music to classical yeah. audience. Well, they were singing spirituals. I don't think they ever sang you know, gospel music as such, but they were singing spirituals. And I think it made, I think it made a huge, huge impression on the, on the white and, and you know, European audiences to hear that kind of music, which is very, very obviously powerful. very beautiful and very moving, very powerful. So tell me the difference between spiritual music and gospel music. So spiritual music is really the t from the time of slavery, has no known authors, and we don't really know how it was sung back then at the time. That's you know, that's what, whereas gospel music is, we, have no, we know who the composers are because they put their name on them, and um, they deliberately set about to create this, um, you know, a spiritual song with a beat, really. Sacred song with a beat, that was their, their mission. Sacred song in the 20s. Yeah, it's from the, from the 20s, the 20s on, and then there's a whole lot of different categories of gospel, you know, and then you, from, you know, traditional or rhythmic spirituals, which is a sort of form of it in a way, um, up to contemporary gospel these days, which is, and all the way, um, gospel has influenced music, clearly. I mean, Ray Charles wouldn't be Ray Charles if he hadn't come and gone to church. And he adapted uh, the song, you know, his great hit, uh, I Got a Woman Way Across Town, which I think started life um, as a gospel song. It was certainly the record came out the same year, called I Got a Savior Up in Heaven, That's Good to Me, Whoa, Whoa, Yeah. You know, so um, gospel music is, has influenced you know the popular forms but at the same time it's taken popular forms you know back in the 30s and so on it, the gospel quartets listened to the mills brothers and the ink spots and in the 60s and stuff they were listening to louis jordan and all, all the trendy years r and b kind of stuff nowadays contemporary gospel i think sounds like music theater you know and hip-hop yeah so, you know the, um, it's pretty amazing so, but in the but in the churches, you know, that I go to in the in the states, they still sing the kind of old traditional sort of style things as well. The old things were kind of run parallel. And it also, you know, you almost you can't stand still. No, <laughs> you know, Why? it's supposed Why to stand. Still? There's a great there's a gospel song <laughs> that says, um, "Sit down, I can't sit down. Sit down, I can't sit down. Sit down, I can't sit down. I just got to heaven and I can't sit down." <laughs> you know, it's really true. So let's talk about, you know, you moved from doing all this composition, you wrote for some film scores or theatre, did uh, you, yeah, in your early days? Yeah, a little bit of days. stuff for the New Zealand film unit, yeah. And so then, like, in, um, you founded an a cappella quartet called The Elevators. Yep. Was yep. that your first... Uh, yeah, that was, yeah, I had a band in Sydney called The Vulgar Beat Men, and I'd been, I'd been playing with Rene Geyer and doing a few other things. And then when the band folded, 
I suddenly had an aha moment where I realised I didn't actually have to carry the drums any longer. You know, it would be really good to do with all that stuff. Um, let's just do it all with voices. So, you know, with some other Kiwis, I got a group called The Elevators together and we did some, uh, you know, old gospel stuff. And then um, uh, I had another moment where we did a gig with a, um, an a cappella, female a cappella quartet. And then the eight of us got together and sang, and I thought, oh, that sounds good. So this is the late 80s, early 90s? This is the late 80s. Sort of not, a cappella wasn't as No, it wasn't everywhere. Used, nobody knew anything about <coughs> it, really. It was, really, there's a group called the Nylons that came out from Canada who toured through Australia. I don't know whether they came to New Zealand. But I think they were very influential at the time. And certainly when I saw them in their peach-coloured satin suits, I went, That's it. That's, uh, <laughs> that looks good. I didn't say it sounds good. I thought, that looks good. So let's explain to the people watching this that, you know, when you're singing gospel, you're not supposed to be humble. You're supposed to be as loud and as emotional as you can be, and, and you also your clothes need to match. That's right. You were telling me um, before we went on air about this incredible reverend who has this gold suit that you met at a, a, at the a yeah. gospel awards ceremony. When yeah, when I was, after the elevators, I started a, a, a choir called The Unwieldy Name of the Café of the Gate of Salvation. Can you tell me how you got to that name? Why Café? Uh, it's too, too long a story. Too, uh, it's not that interesting. It's, okay. just, it's a name of actually of a café in Istanbul or something. I don't know. It's just, uh, I mean, you know, it's like past my drug taking days. I don't know what got <laughs> into me. But, and I should have chosen a name that was like Thug or something like that because it looked yeah. better on a lamppost. Um, you know, but I started this gospel choir after the two So when did you together. leave New Zealand but to go to Australia? Just 1981, the Crocodiles, was with a group called the Crocodiles, and we left um, to make our fortune in Australia. And, and this was over. the funk soul group then? It was more of a, more of a pop, pop band that had grown out of a previous band called Spats. But um, it had Jenny Morris and Bruno Lawrence Fane Floors in it, you know, and um, everybody in it actually went on to become great players and, okay. very, you know, very esteemed musicians. Yeah. Um, not talking about myself. And But you are. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that. You don't have to. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so I went to Australia in 1981, formed another band after that, and then got into the elevators, started the, the Cafe of the Gate of Salvation. Then I realized I wanted to go to, to America to find out more about gospel music and also to meet all the people that I've been listening to on record because they're all up in age. I realized that I was listening to a kind of like a, you know, a tradition that was fading up. We're about to go to a break. Mm. So we'll come back and we'll talk about your, um, your journeys yeah. to America. We'll be back with Tony Backhouse at Chat Room in a minute. Welcome back to Chat Room. We're here with Tony Backhouse in his yellow sweater, who's going to talk about the gold suit and the <laughs> Reverend Frank Campbell. <laughs> um, so, on my first trip to the States, really as a research in a mission, I was lucky enough to go to the Stellar Awards, which are like the equivalent of the, the Grammys, I suppose, in the in the gospel world. Um, how I got there's another story, but and I actually went to the rehearsal and met all these amazing people, the Reverend James Cleveland, the caravans, all these people like superstars, and made friends with Delois Barrett Campbell, who was like the, the top gospel singer in Chicago, and her husband, the Reverend Frank Campbell, who was like a tailor by trade anyway. Um, you can see them in actually a wonderful film called Say I Men Somebody, which was filmed around about the same time. Um, so I went to their church kind of a little bit uh, subsequently anyway, and they were incredibly generous to me. And, what I, and all, everybody was actually fantastically generous to me. You know, when you think about, you know, you talk about Southern hospitality and that, that black culture, incredibly generous. You know, I'm just some Antipodean weirdo who turns <laughs> up, you know, and they kind of embraced me like, you know, long lost cousins, you yeah. know. Um, so, yeah, I went to and the fed States. you and fed me. Ah, oh, fed me more fried chicken than and you know black eyed peas and, all and that, grits and all that. <laughs> so I was lucky to have some very good contacts in the state. Make very good contacts is uh, with music researchers, music ministers, professors of music, and so on like that, who were really incredibly generous in sharing their information with me and taking me to, to introducing me to other churches and so on and so on and so on. So it's ever since then. Um, since 1995, anyway, I've been going back to the States every couple of years, not just on research, but taking groups of singers to people who are fascinated with gospel, 
presumably, to immerse themselves for a couple of weeks in the whole thing. So you're going on one very soon, aren't yeah. you? And tell us where you're going and what are you going to be doing? Uh, we'll be going to Memphis, Tennessee, Chicago, and to New Orleans. Uh, we go to a festival in Memphis. We go to, we have a workshop with a wonderful female quartet called the Moments of Joy. We go to a, another choir rehearsal. When we go to Chicago, we have a workshop with a musicologist who teaches us about slave songs and Civil War kind of music. Uh, we go to another rehearsal with a, another female quartet who actually happens to have like about eight members in it and their, and their siblings and husbands are another band called the Heavenly Kings Junior. We go to a whole lot of churches. We learn a repertoire before we go so that we can actually reciprocate because, you know, it's actually... They want you to perform. It's all about participation, you know, and certainly um, they're very proud of, the, of gospel music and spirituals, you know. I mean, I think they're fascinated that people from halfway around the world will turn up and sing Shine On Me or some, you know, a gospel a song, you know. Can you teach soul? Ooh! <laughs> Look, I, you know, it's, uh, that's like a question about can you, can you sing like a black, you know. Yeah. And certainly a couple of people, um, my African-American um, mentors, have said, if you can speak like a black, you can sing like a black. So presume, you know, you have to actually be part of, that you know, culture. grow up with that culture. Um, I think soul, I don't know, I mean, it's such a vague word, what does it mean? Certainly the, the singers that I really admire in the tradition sing with such conviction, Yeah. You know, and so wholeheartedly. It's a very physical kind of it singing. A, it is a physical kind of thing. I've seen you know, I saw a, a, in a church once, I saw this girl who turned up looking like Whitney Houston and looked like she had the same kind of budget for her hair and everything as Whitney Houston. <laughs> and she'd had the voice lessons as well. She could certainly sing, you know, no melisma was safe, you know. So she sang and it was like really amazing. And there's a, in a black church and not much kind of happened. And then this old guy came out in a suit who clearly was of a completely different era and completely different budget. And his voice wasn't sort of so great. Somehow he's saying from here, and everyone is on fire, sort of yeah. straight away. You know, they can tell the, they can tell the difference. So tell us what you do. You do so many things now. You're teaching workshops. You yeah. coach choirs. Um, give us an idea of what your average <laughs> month is like. Well, okay, my average month is probably running two or three weekend workshops somewhere in Australia or, or New Zealand. Really, in in a, in a black gospel tradition, you know, we form a choir for the weekend really and see what sort of sound we can make. Uh, I'm writing, uh, I'm always writing music, sitting at home in front of the computer or playing the bass or the guitar. And you've written a lot of gospel songs. I've written a lot of stuff that my old choir, the Cafe, the Gate of Salutation, God, it takes a long time to say that name. Yeah. Um, recorded and they, I left them, you know, after 21 years, but they, they're still going in Sydney and I still work with them. So I still write and arrange music for them and for other choirs. And your wife Australia is also yourself. a singer. Yeah, and my wife is a singer. She used to be a professional singer in London for many years, singing jazz. So she and I run together, run um, a gospel choir in Napier that meets on Tuesday nights. And they're giving a, the next performance on August 10th? Yeah, August th yeah gospel vespers at, at Trinity, um, um, at Clive Square. And can anybody come yeah. and join? Yeah, 7 o'clock on that. That Sunday night. Yeah. So how do you free the voice? This is about the <laughs> end thing that the last question I'll ask you before we have to go. I think it's all about relaxation and a commitment and I mean really in my workshops all I'm doing is trying to make it safe for people to go somewhere that they might not have thought is, is possible to go. You know, I'm actually not a voice, uh, vo a vocal coach you know, technically. I'm really, uh, it's more about getting groups of people to feel comfortable and realize that as a group and as human beings we can together in collaboration make a fantastic sound of great beauty and power well i think that's a perfect place to end our conversation <laughs> today <laughs> and i'm really happy you came in to talk great. to us today thank you thanks cheryl my pleasure and that's it for chat room we'll see you next time